I don't know what this weekend has been like for you. For me, it has been uh, outstanding and just uh, struck again in so many new, uh, fresh ways of the goodness and the grace of God. And I hope it's been that way for you too. I hope you've been encouraged. Um, We have a lot of ground to cover in the next hour or so. Uh, So if you would, why don't you uh, pray with me right now? Gracious God, we uh, thank you for our time together this weekend. Father, you have uh, fed us so well from your word through your servants, and we ask that you would take uh, this truth of your word that has been spoken into our lives over the last few hours between last night and again this morning, and that it would teach us where we need to be taught, that it would rebuke us where we need to be rebuked, that it would correct us where we need to be corrected, and that it would train us for righteousness where we need to be trained, also that we may pursue every good work that you have put before us to do for the glory of your name. Holy Spirit, I pray now for you to do the very same things in this session. Would you show us the glory of marriage as you have created it to be? Would you help us to look beyond ourselves and see the greater gospel purpose of our marriages, would you pour out your grace and your favor through your abiding presence on all of us right now, I pray in the name of Jesus, amen. A while ago, uh, there was a story that came out about a guy that was affectionately given the nickname Larry Lawn Chair. Um, Larry was given that name after a real-life incident in 1982. Let me read for you some of the press release uh, that introduced the world to Larry Launcher. Larry's boyhood dream was to fly. When he graduated from high school, he joined the Air Force with hopes of becoming a pilot. To his dismay, poor eyesight disqualified him. When he was eventually discharged, his only satisfaction came in watching jets fly over his backyard. But one day, Larry had a bright idea. He decided that he was going to fly. So he went to his local army surplus store, which is always a great idea when you got someone like this in mind, and he bought 45 weather balloons and several tanks of helium. The weather balloons, when fully inflated, measured more than four feet across. Back home, Larry securely strapped the balloons to his sturdy lawn chair, which he anchored to the bumper of his Jeep. He then inflated the balloons with helium and climbed into the chair for a test while it was still only a few feet above the ground. Satisfied that it would work, Larry packed several sandwiches and drinks and loaded his pellet gun, figuring that he could pop a few balloons when it was time for him to come back down. So he tied himself to the lawn chair along with his pellet gun and provisions. Larry's plan was to lazily float up to a height of about 30 feet above his backyard after severing the anchor, and after a few hours, he would come back down. But things did not quite work out that way. When he cut the cord that anchored the lawn chair to his Jeep, Larry did not lazily float up to 30 feet or so. Instead, he streaked into the L.A. sky as if he was shot from a cannon. He did not level off at 30 feet, Nor did he level off at 100 feet. After climbing and climbing, Larry leveled off at approximately 16,000 feet in the air. Yeah. At that height, he could not risk shooting any of the balloons in case he unbalanced the load, and then he'd really find himself in trouble, so he stayed there, drifting, cold and helpless, at 16,000 feet. Then he got himself in real trouble because he found himself drifting into the primary approach quarter of Long Beach International Airport. Strangely enough, Larry was first spotted by a United Airlines pilot. The pilot radioed the tower and described passing a guy in a lawn chair. (laughs) With a gun. And he was eating a sandwich. (laughs) Meanwhile, feeling cold and dizzy in the thin air three miles above the ground, Larry did what many middle-aged American men would do in a stressful situation. He cracked open a six-pack. And then he began to shoot several of the balloons with his pellet gun to come back down to the earth. 
He attempted to aim his descent at a large expanse of grass on the North Long Beach Country Club, but Larry came up short and ended up tangling his tethers in a set of high-voltage power lines about 10 miles from his liftoff site. The plastic tethers protected Larry from electrocution as he dangled above the ground until firemen and utility crews could cut power to the lines. Larry managed to maneuver his chair over to a wall, step out, and cut the chair free. The first group to meet Larry were not the reporters, but the police, who immediately gave Larry a ticket for the obstruction of airport traffic to the tune of $4,000. But then the reporters found him, and they asked him three questions. Question number one, Larry, were you scared? To which Larry replied, yes, I was very scared. Question two, Larry, would you do it again? To which Larry replied, no, I will never do this again. Question number three, Larry, why did you do it? And Larry simply said, well, a guy can't just sit around. Now, I share that story with you because I'm guessing in a crowd this size, and especially in a crowd of all men, that there are some guys here in this room right now, and we have done things that are like one part heroic, two parts dangerous, and three parts like absolutely stupid. And, and it makes me think actually of my brother-in-law, uh, the story that I heard my brother-in-law tell when he was a teenager, he, he made his own fulcrum. You know what a fulcrum is? It's like that little triangle that you place on the ground and then you put a board on top and it functions a little bit like a mini teeter-totter. So he made his own fulcrum and he took his best friend's little sister and put her on the far end of the board and then he climbed up onto the roof of his garage and he jumped off the top of the roof of the garage onto the near end of the board so that the full amount of his body weight, and he's a pretty big boy, full man of his body weight then shot the little girl straight into the air and him and his best friend thought this was the funniest thing ever. They laughed and laughed and it probably was the funniest thing they'd ever done up to that point in their life. And I remember the first time he told me that story and I thought to myself, like, dude, one, you're my hero and, and two, that's crazy and three, like, cue up the lawsuit, right? Like, that's just nuts. But somewhere Deep inside, I think it illustrates for all of us that as men especially, we know that we're made for something more. We know there's a longing deep within us that we are made for something more. We long for something that's going to push us beyond the way that it's always been and take us to new heights, which is what we really want. We know deep down inside that God has created us for something more than just the day-to-day, -day, normal, day-after-day -day routine that we always seem to keep going through. And so with that in mind, I want to invite you now to take your Bibles and open with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians 5, we read the longest single block of instruction that God gives us in all of his word about the subject of marriage. And what we find in Ephesians 5 is that God actually sets the bar incredibly high. He sets the bar high, not only in terms of his expectations for marriage, but he sets the bar incredibly high in terms of his expectations for us as husbands within our marriages. you got to understand right off the top that Ephesians 5 is like the 16,000 foot view of what God really created our marriages to be. And, and I hope you see how significant this actually is. Because we live in a world, we live in a culture that is satisfied with giving us just the ground level view, right? That's not going to work hard to give us the ultimate view. They're just satisfied with giving us the ground level view of marriage, of, of giving us a view that is subpar and mediocre at best. It's a world that challenges God's design at every turn, especially when it comes to many of the things that God says right here in this passage in Ephesians 5. But even more difficult is that when it comes to the God-given roles of husband and wife, that many in the church have challenged this as well. To think that what the church once quickly confirmed is now for some time being quietly questioned. And it's heartbreaking, isn't it? I mean, is it not heartbreaking to look across the landscape of churches in our country, to look across maybe the landscape of many churches that are represented in this room right now and to sit in counseling rooms with so many couples and see how many of God's children have simply settled for a ground-level view of marriage when God has told us exactly what it means and what it looks like for our marriages to soar for the glory of God. 
And I don't know about you, but for me, it's concerning that it's not just the world that needs to be educated about God's standard for marriage, but equally concerning more and more and more that we see is that the church needs to be re-educated about what God has already said. So what I want to do today, let's, let's just start by reading through this passage, Ephesians 5. We're going to start in verse 25. And let's just trust that, that right now, in this moment, as we read God's word together, that God is going to teach us again. He's going to show us yet again exactly what he desires for us to know. So Ephesians 5, starting at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is such an amazing passage and there is so much that is packed into these few verses. And, and before we even go any farther, I feel like I need to offer some kind of disclaimer to you right now. I, I've been preparing for this message over the past couple of weeks, and I've been convicted all over again in my own life about the ways that I need to be the spiritual leader of my home, the ways that I need to grow in my role as a husband to my wife. And not only that, but I want to tell you right off the top that I am certainly not here to impress you with some new angle on marriage that you've never heard of before. And I'm not here to tell you something about your marriage that has not already been said in one way or another. I'm certainly not here with any intention of giving you a bunch of tips and tricks and ideas about how to have your best marriage now or how to have a better marriage by Friday or this or that. I mean, how many times this weekend alone have we been reminded that we are in a war? That this is a battle. In a crowd this size, there's probably some here whose marriages are on the line. Your families are hanging in the balance. And what you need right now, what we need right now, is not the philosophy of man. What we need right now is the word of God. We need God to speak to us right now from his word. So here's what I want to do today. I want to show you right from this passage in Ephesians 5 that we just read. I want to show you three realities and then three responses. Three realities to what God has designed our role as husbands to be in our marriages. And then three responses, three ways for us to put those realities into practice. So you can jot these down as we make our way through this passage. Here's the first reality that we see. The glory of Christ is our highest aim. The glory of Christ is our highest aim. This really is the theme when you think about it all the way through the book of Ephesians. The glory of Christ is our highest aim. It begins in chapter 1. God has brought about this amazing plan of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, so that ultimately all things will be united in Christ, whether in heaven or on earth. Chapter 2, even though we were once dead in our sins, God has made us alive together with Christ and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Furthermore, because of the shed blood of Christ on the cross, we who were once far off have been brought near to God. We are members of God's household with Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Chapter 3, all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are welcomed into this body because of Christ. 
And this body exists for the primary purpose of bringing ultimate glory to Christ throughout all generations, both now and forevermore. Then because of all of that, chapters 4 and 5, we are to live a life that reflects the transforming work of Christ within us, realizing that it is Christ who holds all of us together as his body. Only then to get to the final words of chapter 6, where Paul says, Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. So this whole book, from start to finish, this entire letter is about the glory of Jesus Christ. But then look again at the first few verses here in our passage, and you're going to see it again. Chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The glory of Jesus Christ is the highest aim of marriage. It is the highest aim of your marriage. It is the highest aim of my marriage. So let me say this another way. Our understanding and practice of marriage will flow from our understanding of the atonement of Christ. Because that's what we see right here in these first couple of verses, verse 25. Our understanding and practice of marriage will flow from our understanding of the atonement of Christ. The way that we express love for our wives should be directly related to the way that we understand what Christ has done for us within the gospel. And so we need to have a much better understanding of what Christ has done for us that goes well beneath the surface. I mean, guys, we can't be satisfied with a depth of our theology that stops at Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I mean, is that true? Yes. Yes and amen, that's true. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, I know that Jesus loves me. Yes, the Bible tells me that Jesus loves me. All of that is gloriously true in the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that it is gloriously true. But it needs to go deeper than that. It needs to go farther than that within our lives because what we see here in these first few verses in this passage is that this whole idea, this whole concept, this whole relationship of marriage is swallowed up in the greater story of the gospel. That in the beginning, I mean, we just heard Vance unpack this beautifully, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. And he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So God created man in his image, male and female. He created them and God saw that everything that he had made was good. But then in an act of rebellion, the first man and the first woman sinned against God. And that one sin had consequences for every man and every woman since them. Because just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Every one of us is born sinful and our sin separates us from the holy God. But... That holy God loves us so much that even while we were still sinners, he sends his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus is our redemption. Jesus is our justification. Jesus is our reconciliation. Jesus is our propitiation. Jesus is our victory. Jesus is the only one who can save us. Because there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. So that all who hear this good news, all who hear the sound of my voice, and all who hear the good news of this gospel and believe in Jesus will not spend eternity separated from him, but will spend eternity with him. It is by God's grace that you are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you believe in him, he has a home in heaven that he has prepared for you. And his promise to you and to me is that one day he is coming again in unequal power and in uncontested glory to deliver his people. This is the God who at this very moment, while you and I are gathered here in this room right now, at this conference, this weekend, he is sitting on the throne of the entire universe and has been for all time and he will for all time. And this is the God before whom we will spend all of eternity bowed, crying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. I mean, this is the good news of our salvation. So you got to understand, guys, that the better and deeper that we understand what Christ has done for us, 
that we who were once far off from God have been brought near to him. When you begin to understand that better and deeper, then the better and deeper that we love our wives like Jesus loved his church. So just think for a minute about the kind of impact that that has then on the marriages that are represented in this room right now. When you go deeper in your understanding of the gospel, deeper in your understanding of what Christ has done for you, the impact it has on your marriage is that forgiveness then becomes foundational. Grace becomes essential. Sacrifice becomes central. Patience becomes indispensable. Real, lasting, biblical love between husband and wife becomes radical. In fact, Paul tells us here what it looks like for a husband to love his wife like Christ loves the church. Just look at these few verses. You can see four things that he unpacks here. I'm going to give you four words to describe this Christ-like love. Here's the first word, resolve. Resolve. So to love my wife like Christ loves the church, I need to resolve to love her. The word Paul uses for love in this passage means to seek the highest good of the other person. But notice how many times he uses this word here in this passage. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. So we read through this passage six times. He uses that one single word just in these first few verses. And and why so many times in such a short section? Well, partly because for two redeemed sinners to make it work within a marriage means that the husband must resolve to make this kind of love his priority. Kind of love where he's constantly putting the highest good of his wife ahead of his own self. I mean, you got to see that this is, this is like the long-haul kind of love. This is the long-term kind of love so that when the arguments arise, and they do, and when the selfishness surfaces within our lives, and it does, and when all of this keeps happening over and over and over again within our hearts, and it will, that it's almost like we look at our wives, we look at the one that God has given to us, and we say to ourselves, I have promised to love her. I've promised to love her like Jesus loves me, like Jesus loves the church. I have promised to put her highest good ahead of my own. So the first word is resolve. The second word then is renewal. Renewal, verse 26. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So Christ is sanctifying his church. He has set us apart to be devoted to God, and and he's cleansing his church. That word cleanse there means to purify, but it can also mean to heal. This is what Christ does for his people. So just imagine yourself for a minute standing under a rushing waterfall, and the water cascades over the edge, and and you're standing directly in the path of this falling water, but when that water falls on you, it's, it's not really overwhelming so much as it is refreshing, because as it comes down upon you, it's washing away the impurities, and it's bringing healing and renewal to you. And what's the waterfall that Paul says here? The end of verse 26, he says, it's the word. It's the word of God. Like the one thing that will bring sanctifying and cleansing to your wife, the one thing that brings healing and renewal to her soul is how the gospel cleanses the way that she lives. It's how the word of God shapes who she is. Now, at this point, we we need to be careful with this, right? Because as husbands, we don't cleanse anybody. We don't sanctify anyone like Christ does for us, but... But just think about this for a minute. If the emotional well-being and the spiritual growth of your wife depended solely on the way that you spoke to her, if it depended only on the words that came out of your mouth in conversation with her, would she be closer to Christ because of you? Or would she be close to Christ in spite of you? Like, what is it? What is it that you're saying to her? What is it that you're communicating to her? What's the message that she most often hears from you? Is it fear? Failure? Guilt? 
condemnation, maybe indifference? Or does she hear gospel truth from you? Like, does she hear from you that she is created by God and she is loved by God and she is redeemed by God and she is gifted by God and she is cherished by God and she is set apart for God and she is valued by you? I mean, think about this, guys. What's your priority when it comes to getting your wife and your family to a Jesus-loving, Bible-preaching, gospel-centered church every weekend where your wife and your kids are going to hear the message of the gospel every single time, that you can go there with confidence knowing that she is going to be washed with the water of the word? How are you making time for her to use and develop the gifts that the Spirit of God has given her? Think about it. This is all part of the renewal that the Bible talks about. It's part of how we love our wives like Christ loved the church. And then verse 27 tells us why this matters so much. Here's the third word, reserved. Reserved, verse 27. Paul says, so that he might present the church to himself. Now, don't skip over that because our tendency would, would be just to read that and just keep moving on. But but notice how significant that is. So that he might present the church to himself. That is staggering. I mean, the reason that Jesus is sanctifying and cleansing us is so that one day he can take us and present us to himself. Like, that's amazing. Weddings are one of my favorite parts about being a pastor. I... I love that moment when the ceremony is just beginning and the bride is standing in the hallway in the back with her father and she is nervous and excited and the groom is standing up at the front of the room and, and I'm up there with him and for as excited and nervous as the bride is at the back, he's up at the front and he is like totally terrified. And, but that, that all changes when the door at the back of the room swings open and for the first time the groom sees his bride holding the arm of her father and he ushers her in, and, and that's easily, easily like my favorite part of the entire ceremony because at that particular point, I look over to the groom who's standing like right here, and, and I can see him, and one of two things are about to happen in that moment. He's either about to cry his face off or he's about to pee his pants. Like, <laughs> like it could go either way, right? And only the strong ones make it. But, but then his bride walks down the aisle, and, and he receives her when she gets to the front, and and it's almost like instantly the terror of the groom is replaced with joy. And, and now Buddy is standing there at the front of the room with his bride on his arm. And, and he's looking at her and he's got this look on his face like, you are the one that God has prepared for me. I mean, you think about this. Like think about all of the purpose and the intention that God put into giving Eve to Adam. And then think about all of the purpose and the intention that, that we put into making wedding ceremonies come across just right, even though they're never just right. And all of that is like this super small picture of what Christ is doing in us. He's purposely using all of the experiences in our life and, and he intentionally uses our marriages to get us ready for that day when he will take us and he will present us to himself as his bride. Why? Because we belong to him. We are his. And the Bible's saying here that as a husband, one of the ways that we love our wives like Christ loves the church is to prepare her for that day. Prepare her for that moment when she will be with Christ and she will know in its fullest sense that she belongs to him. So keep thinking about this, guys. Keep going down this road. Ultimately, she does not belong to you. Like, in an earthly, temporal sense, yes, she does, as your wife. But in an eternal, heavenly sense, she belongs to Jesus. And your marriage is a gift from God that he has entrusted to you for a time. And, and the God-given mandate to every husband is for us to help our wives prepare for the day that she will stand, not before us as her husband, but before Jesus as her Savior. Which then leads to the final word, which is radiant. Look again, verse 27. So that 
he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. You know, there's probably a lot of us who can stand up right now and testify that our marriage or parenting has been one of the most sanctifying experiences of our entire lives. And according to verse 27, that's what marriage is supposed to be. It's what it's supposed to do. One commentator said it like this, a husband is to be concerned not primarily for his wife's short-term happiness, but for her long-term holiness. And on the face of that, I would agree with that, but I would take it even one step further and say that your wife's greatest happiness will be found in the depth of her holiness. Your wife's greatest happiness is going to be found in the depth of her holiness. I mean, you want true happiness, you want true joy, you want true freedom, you want true blessing in this life, then follow Jesus, right? I mean, that's the way it's always been. It's the way it is for all of us. It's where true happiness is found. One of the primary ways that God has given a Christian wife to realize the realities of the atonement within her life is through her Christian husband. And that's why the glory of Christ must be our highest aim. But then we also see the second reality. Number two, the love of Christ is our strongest example. The love of Christ is our strongest example. Take a look at verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Notice he begins verse 28 by saying, in the same way. So in the same way that Jesus loved the church. So see this. Christ loves his own body, the church, so much that he gave his own body on the cross. And so, because we are members of his body, he cares for and he provides for us in specific ways. The problem, though, is that we're more concerned about how we can take care of and provide for ourselves long before we think of taking care of and providing for anybody else, right? I mean, isn't that really kind of the way that it first went sideways in the Garden of Eden all those years ago? I mean, Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes to Eve and convinces her that God did not really mean something that he actually said. So the Bible says that Eve took a piece of fruit and she ate, and she gave some also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, when it says in Genesis 3 verse 6 that that her husband was there with her, we're at the early points in, in the book of Genesis, in the early parts of creation, where Adam and Eve are literally the only two people on the face of the earth. Like, there is nobody else. They are it. And God has made them to be together. He has made them to be with one another. And so it's not like they're off doing their own things and and exploring and enjoying the vastness of God's amazing creation and, and everything that's around them. No, they're together. They're with one another. So it's not like Adam's off killing dinner and then coming back. And in the meantime, Eve's at home, like, knitting scarves and making cinnamon buns or something that, that Paul Tripp would love. And... <laughs> So no, they're, they're together, they're with one another. And so when the Bible says in Genesis 3, verse 6, that her husband was there with her, it means that while Eve was reaching up into the tree and picking this piece of fruit, and then looking at this piece of fruit, and then opening her mouth to eat this piece of fruit, and then taking a bite of the piece of fruit, Adam is standing right there. Like he is right beside her the whole time. And I don't know what you think as you read through that story, but I get to that point and and I'm stopping and I'm thinking to myself, okay, so what's Adam thinking in that moment? Like what's going through his mind in that moment? Like I wonder if he was just standing there watching this whole thing unravel right in front of him and is he standing there thinking to himself, huh, huh, Like, God said that if we eat a piece of fruit from that particular tree, then we will surely die. Eve is about to eat a piece of fruit from that particular tree. I wonder if she's going to (laughs) die. And the dude just stands there. He doesn't do anything. 
Like, he doesn't reach in. He doesn't, like, dive in slow motion across the garden to make sure none of this happens. Like, he just stands there. And then he sees that Eve doesn't actually die right in that instant. And then I wonder if he's standing there again, and he's thinking to himself, huh, maybe all of this stuff that God has said about sin and rebellion against him really isn't that big of a deal after all. And isn't that the way it goes every single time with the sin in our lives? It's kind of like how they try to kill a wolf up in the farthest parts of the north. Maybe you've heard this analogy before. Wolves up in the north prey on seals. So when they want to kill the wolf, they take a two-edged knife and they dip it in seal's blood and they let it freeze. And they'll do this several times until they have several layers of frozen blood that's covering the blade. And then they'll take the handle of the, the knife and they'll bury it in the ground so that only the blade is sticking straight up above the ground. Eventually, the wolf picks up the scent of the seal blood. He makes his way over and he starts to lick the frozen blood. The wolf then becomes so intoxicated with the seal blood that he just keeps licking and licking and licking, but his tongue becomes so numb because it's so cold. The problem is that he, as he keeps licking, he eventually gets down to the blade, but he can no longer feel his own tongue. So as he's licking, he's cutting his own tongue to shreds. So now the blood that's coming out of his mouth is no longer the seal blood. It's his own blood. And it's not until it's too late that the wolf realizes that he has just destroyed himself. And that's the way sin works in our hearts every time we let it go unchecked. Sin deceives us into thinking every single time that we have something really good and that we have something that we really need and we have something that is finally going to satisfy the longing of our heart and it never does. Maybe you don't think that the passivity or the indifference within your marriage right now is a big deal because you don't see the consequences of it yet. Guys, we, we can't be pulling an atom in our marriage. We can't be sitting around and thinking to ourselves, huh, like my wife can make all the decisions and she can take care of the kids and she can figure all of these things out on her own because I don't really care. And in the meantime, your passivity is creating a vacuum of leadership within your marriage that is forcing your wife into a role that she was never designed to have. It's no wonder it's not working. It's not cool. And it's definitely not biblical. I mean, this whole indifference thing, like, can you imagine Adam standing there in the garden watching this whole thing happen and, and he doesn't do anything? He's just kind of indifferent to the way that the whole thing's going. And this whole indifference thing that we see so often in marriage, like, I don't really care what happens. I don't really care what my wife does. I don't care where she goes. I don't care what she wears. I'm just going to go and play my video games and hang out with my buddies and I don't really care what my wife and kids are doing. Guys, listen. There is nothing passive or indifferent about marching a lonely path to a cross. It's not the way that Jesus loved the church. What our wives need is for us to love them in the same way that Jesus loves us. And one of the ways that we do that is by following the example of Jesus who stepped into the gap that existed between us and God. So guys, when something happens and and you see that gap getting larger and larger between you and your wife, or when the suffering comes or the trials happen or you're going through a difficult stretch for whatever reason and you see that gap getting larger and larger between your wife and God, Guys, that is no time to be passive and indifferent. You need to step into that gap, not for the purpose of trying to give your wife something that only God is able to give her, but to step into that gap to gently draw her back to the presence of God so that you can place her in the position where God alone is able to give her exactly what she needs. That's loving your wife like Jesus loves the church. But let's flip that on its head for a second. It's not just the passivity and the indifference. For some husbands, the issue is throwing around your authority. It's throwing around your authority like a sledgehammer. Whatever it hits, it destroys. And you demand that your wife submit to you and to your leadership and that she does whatever you say and whatever you want. And and sadly, that's what many husbands see in this passage. And if that's all we see in this passage, then 
there's a good chance that the marriage doesn't stand a chance because the husband is constantly confused and the wife is constantly afraid. Maybe for some of you, even sitting in this room right now, that is all that you see in this passage. It's the command for your wife to submit to you. And if that's all you see here, then you are missing the point because even that command for her to submit to your leadership is rooted in the love of Christ. I believe it was Martin Lloyd-Jones who said something to the effect that the instruction for the wife to submit to her husband is not the husband's right to demand. It is the wife's command to obey. So when you lead and love in the right ways, I mean, just think for a minute about the trickle down on this. Just think for a minute about the ways that it's going to affect your marriage. When your wife has the confidence of knowing that you love her like Christ loves you, that you're going to love her like you love yourself because you know that there is no other way on God's green earth that you would ever end up with such an amazing wife were it not for the grace of God being poured out upon you, right? I mean, I can amen that for myself for sure. But when she has that kind of confidence that you are going to love her in that way, then all of a sudden her submission to your leadership and to your headship within your marriage is no longer a burden for her to carry. It is a blessing for her to celebrate. Maybe you're sitting here right now and you're just thinking to yourself, well, wait just a second, man, because that's my problem. Like, that's exactly my problem. I don't know how to lead her. I don't know how to love her in these ways. I don't know what that looks like because she's smarter than I am and she's more spiritual than I am and she reads her Bible more than I do and she knows more of the Bible than I do and she's better looking than I am and you've got all of these strikes supposedly against you, right? And if that's you, if that's where you are right now, then to you I would simply say this. That is the whole point of what this passage is saying right here. The place where you begin is by making the love of Christ your strongest example. Love her like Jesus loves us. Love her like Jesus loves you. Love her like Jesus loves his church. Which leads then to point number three. The faithfulness of Christ is our greatest hope. Look again at verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So notice what he's saying here. From the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve and established the very first marriage, his intention was always for marriage to reflect the perfect love that Jesus Christ has for his church. And again, I cannot stress this enough. Our understanding of what Christ has accomplished for us in redemption sets the pattern for how we are to love our wives within our marriages. To help us see that in verse 31, Paul reaches all the way back to what God said in Genesis 2. He said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So see here at least three qualities of a Christ-exalting marriage. Notice this first, multiplication. Multiplication, not in the sense so much of be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, more in the sense that there comes a natural point for every person where we leave the protective care and the primary influence of our parents. And so some of you in the room, maybe right now you're newly married or you're relatively newly married, your protective care and your primary influence is no longer from your parents. It's for your wife. So you need to leave your parents. Others of you have children who are newly married or have been married for a little while. and Their protective care and their primary influence no longer comes from you. It comes from their spouse. And you need to let them leave. So unless a person has been clearly given the gift of singleness so that they can serve the Lord with greater effectiveness... We leave our father and mother so that we can begin our own family in the way that God designed for it to be. So part of the pattern of marriage includes multiplication, but it also means sanctification. We see this emphasis here again. Verse 31 says that a man leaves his father and mother and holds fast to his wife. So to hold fast literally means to have the strongest bond that you can possibly develop. I love hearing stories of people who do really dumb things. 
Like, just love it. Like, when people use too much super glue to, like, glue their hands together or, or they glue their face to a wall or something, I, I just find those stories unusually funny and worthy of great mockery. And, but you know, you know how hard it is to unglue something that has been super glued together, right? And that's the point here. That's the idea of what he's saying here. So if you hold to a high and biblical view of marriage, you need to understand that part of the reason God has brought you together with your wife is to sanctify you, to hold fast with one another so that no matter what gets thrown at us, no matter how hard the storm winds blow, we are staying together because we believe that the most important thing for us individually and the most important thing for us as husband and wife together is to be more like Jesus. And God is somehow going to use this storm, use this difficulty, use this trial within our marriage to make sure that happens. God's purpose is for you to be unbreakably bound together. One author describes engagement like you're walking through an amusement park with foggy glasses on. That's what engagement is like. And he says, you can be walking through the park, but there's so much around you that you don't see clearly, but you don't really care because you're having such a great time. And it's not until you get married that you're able to see some things clearly that you could not see before. Not only in your spouse, but also in yourself that you hadn't seen earlier. And he goes on to say that God orders the pace of sanctification within all of our lives according to factors that we cannot see and to grow us in ways that he ultimately knows that we need. And for all the things that we did not see in our spouse until we got married, the grace of God helps us through those things. And, and he says it's like the brokenness of two sinners within a marriage becomes then the theater for displaying the power and the redemption of Jesus Christ. So marriage is about multiplication It's about sanctification. And then this, it's about unification. The end of verse 31, he says, and the two shall become one flesh. So marriage is about husband and wife coming together physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every possible way. Think about this. So many marriages fall apart because of the absence of unification. And maybe you're sitting here thinking to yourself, well, thanks, Captain Obvious. That's really helpful. Um, so many marriages fall apart because of the absence of unification. On the surface, that's a very basic observation. Of course, if a couple's not unified, then there's not much of a chance that their marriage is going to last. And yet, for as simple as that may be, unification is glaringly absent when a marriage falls apart. One pastor I heard described it like this. What if you were to make it your aim in your everyday decision-making to humble yourself before each other to the point where you deferred your preferences so that you could do what your spouse wants? What if you were to make it your aim in your everyday decision-making to humble yourselves before each other to the point where you deferred your preferences so that you could do what your spouse wants? And you say, well, wait a minute. I, I thought the husband was the one who was supposed to lead. I thought the husband had the responsibility before God to make the decisions. Yes, the husband does have responsibility before God to love and lead his wife. But the vast majority of decisions that need to be made within your marriage are not spiritual leadership decisions. So what if, in the pursuit of unification, you were to put the desires of your spouse ahead of your own? Not just as a symbol of your love for them, but as a sign of your covenant commitment to them. So Paul says here, he kind of ties a bow on this at the end, and he says, this mystery is profound. Like the mystery of how when God created marriage in the first pages of the Bible, we see a foreshadow of the gospel love that thousands of years later would become a reality in Jesus Christ and not only become a reality, but we would see with clarity that Jesus is the only one who perfectly loves us in all the ways that God describes right here in Ephesians chapter 5. That Jesus is the one who left his father. And despite the suffering that he endured, he stayed perfectly faithful to his father. And even today, despite the grief he endures because of our unfaithfulness to him, that despite the sorrow that he feels when our marriages break apart, that he stays perfectly faithful to us, his church, his bride. Why? Why? So that we can be united with him. So that we can be reconciled to God. 
I mean, when you think about it like that, that truly is nothing short of profound. And that, Paul says, is why the faithfulness of Christ is our greatest hope. So, if the glory of Christ is our highest aim, and the love of Christ is our strongest example, and the faithfulness of Christ is our greatest hope, then what must we do? Well, here's three responses to those three realities. You can jot these down. Here's response number one. Love your wife radically. Love your wife radically. We've already said that the word love in this passage indicates a desire to seek the highest good of the other person, but it's also a word of obligation. In other words, this is not the kind of love that you just kind of give to somebody else depending on how you happen to feel on any given day. It's the kind of love that requires action. So Paul's calling for action here in this passage to love your wife radically. There's a really painful but glorious picture of this in the Old Testament The book of Hosea is the story of God relentlessly pursuing his people who have repeatedly turned away from him. And God uses marriage as an illustration of his commitment to do whatever he needs to do in order to bring his people back. So God tells this man, Hosea, to marry a prostitute whose name was Gomer and have children with her, even though she's going to be unfaithful to him. Because all of it would serve as a picture of how Israel acted like a prostitute by turning away from God and loving false gods and putting their hope in other nations to save them instead of depending on God to come through for them when they needed him. So the story gets really bad because Gomer commits immorality in broad daylight. Like She's selling herself to other men who are not her husband. She is publicly shaming Hosea and eventually she leaves Hosea for another guy. But get this, Hosea loves her so much that he goes to this other guy and he starts giving this other guy money to take care of her. Even though this other guy abuses her and never comes through on any of the promises that he's made to her. Later, this other guy gets tired of Gomer and decides to sell her to the highest bidder. So God tells Hosea again to go and buy Gomer, even though Gomer rightfully belongs to him already. And even though it would financially break Hosea, it would cost him everything he had and then some that he didn't have. Why does God tell him to do that? Because this marriage between Hosea and Gomer is a picture of how God's people are looking for fulfillment and answers for life in anything but God. And yet, God keeps pursuing his people because he loves them with this kind of radical, unbelievable kind of love. And so finally, in Hosea 11 verse 8, God turns to his people and he says this, How can I give you up, Israel? How can I let you go? I mean, my heart is torn within me, God says. And my compassion overflows. That's amazing. What's God saying here? He's saying that our sin and our brokenness grieves him greatly, but he loves us so much that he can't and he won't let us go. He loves us with his perfect love. See, Hosea represents God and Gomer represents us. We are the ones who keep turning away from God. We are the ones who commit sin in broad daylight by looking to anything but God for the fulfillment that we desire. And yet, because of his commitment, his covenant commitment to us, God keeps coming after us, even though it would cost him everything in his only son. First and foremost, to redeem the brokenness of our hearts, but then to redeem the brokenness of the most important human relationships that we will ever have. Again, God uses marriage to give us this picture of his radical love for us, so that no matter how many times we turn away from him in unfaithfulness, he always is, and he always will be the God who loves us with this mysterious mysteriously profound devotion. So think about this. How does this apply to marriage? How does this apply to your marriage? Well, when we get married, we know that we are a sinner saved by grace. And we are marrying another sinner who is saved by that very same grace. So that after we get married and when sin continues to happen, There is grace for one another because of the grace that God has given to us. There is love and there is mercy and there is compassion and there is kindness and there is patience and there is tenderness because God has given all of those things and so much more to us in his son, Jesus Christ. Love your wife radically. 
And then response number two, lead your wife dependently. I hope it's really clear by now that there is no way that you can love your wife in this way that Paul describes in Ephesians 5. There's no way that I can love my wife this way according to what Paul describes in Ephesians 5, not by myself. Because I think we've all been alive long enough to know that our tendency, first and foremost, is to take care of ourselves. Our tendency is to nourish ourselves. Our tendency is to love ourselves long before we take care of and nourish and love anybody else, including our wife, which is why we so desperately need Jesus Christ to live his life through us. See, our power and our ability to live in this way is not in ourselves, men. It's only the love and the power of Jesus Christ in us at work through the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about this kind of radical, extreme love that glorifies God and lifts high the name of Jesus. So our call is to lead our wives from a place of humility before Jesus Christ where we are down on our knees pleading with him to help us bring about the life and heart of Jesus within our wife. To bring about the life and heart of Jesus within us. So love your wife radically, lead your wife dependently, and then finally this, lose yourself willingly. Lose yourself willingly. This really is the bottom line. For us to love our wife radically and lead our wife dependently, we must lose ourselves willingly. Everything that the Bible talks about here in Ephesians 5 and and in so many other passages across the Bible that talk about marriage, it all depends on the power of Jesus Christ within us. It all depends on you and I dying daily to taking the easy way out. So let me ask you, if you were to look over the cross-section of your life right now, What is it that's interfering with your ability to lose yourself willingly for the sake of loving your wife radically and leading your wife dependently? What is it that's getting in your way right now of losing yourself before Jesus Christ to love your wife in this way? For some of you, it's going to be a job or a hobby or a golf game or an addiction or a fishing trip. For some, it might even be something that started good but turned out bad, like an overcommitment to doing too many things at church. For others, it's going to be overcoming your fear, overcoming your fear of learning how to love your wife like this, overcoming your fear of learning how to lead your wife like this. For some of you, it's going to be repenting of your indifference and your passivity. Still, for others, it may start by you simply going home today and looking your wife in the eyes and asking her if she will forgive you and if you can start again. In his book, The Meaning of Marriage, a book that I would highly recommend, Tim Keller tells the story of one of the old czars of Russia. He had a trusted general who was dying of his wounds and when the soldier was on his deathbed, the czar promised to raise the soldier's young son and take care of him. After the general died, the czar carried out his promise to his friend. And so he gave the young boy the best place to live and the best education that Russia had to offer. He had a place to serve in the army. But as the young man grew older, he developed an addiction to gambling. And eventually he could no longer cover his debts, so he began to embezzle some of the army's money. And one night he was sitting alone in his tent. He was doing the books, and he realized that his embezzlement was about to be discovered. And so he spent the night drinking heavily and was getting ready to take his life. He had a revolver sitting at his side, took a few more drinks to try and strengthen his resolve. But the drink was so powerful that he ended up passing out on the table. That same night, as all of that was happening, the czar was doing what he often did. He he disguised himself as a simple soldier and was walking through the camp to try and gauge the morale of his army. He walked into his foster son's tent and saw him passed out on top of the books. So he read the book and he saw the gun and he connected the dots and he realized what his foster son was about to do. When the soldier woke up hours later, to his shock, the revolver was gone and in its place there was a letter. It was a note saying, I, the czar, will pay the full amount from my own personal funds to make up the difference found in this book. And it was sealed with the czar's personal seal. He had clearly seen the young man's sin, but he had covered it and paid for it personally. 
Keller goes on to write this. Here's why you can say to your spouse who has wronged you, I see your sin, but I can cover it with forgiveness. Because Jesus saw my sin and covered it with his forgiveness. It's because the Lord of the universe came into the world in disguise in the person of Jesus Christ and he looked into our hearts and he saw the worst. And it wasn't an abstract exercise for Jesus, Keller writes. Our sin put him to death. When Jesus was up there nailed to the cross, he looked down and saw us, some denying him, some betraying him, all forsaking him. He saw our sin and he covered it. I do not know of any more powerful resource for granting forgiveness than that. I don't know anything more necessary in marriage than the ability to forgive fully, freely, unpunishingly from the heart. This is only one of a multitude of ways that shows why our ability to love our wife radically and lead our wife dependently demands that we lose ourselves willingly to this dangerous calling of a God-honoring, Christ-exalting, spirit-empowered marriage for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you first and foremost for your great and awesome and perfect love for us, love that we do not deserve, and yet you freely give and so we joyfully receive. Lord, thank you for your mercy upon us. Thank you for your kindness, your tenderness, your compassion, your faithfulness, O oh God, of which we have heard so much this weekend. We have sung so much this weekend about all that you are and all that you have done for us in Christ. I pray, God, I pray for every man in this room, including myself, that you would strengthen us, that you would help us to love our wives, Lord Jesus, like you love your church. Pray that you would find across this room right now men who understand that there is no possible way for us to do that unless, Lord, you live your life through us. You live your life in us. We desperately need your help, God. In a culture that has gone so far in the other direction, we need your help to draw close to you. So God, we commit these things to you. Thankful for this opportunity and this time in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.